for simple harmonic motion, we're going to need some extra equations for this HL business. So remember that when we have something going in simple harmonic motion, we have this x is di the displacement. And what's going to happen then is that at some, at some point, maybe over here, it's at its maximum displacement. Right? And we're going to actually call that x0. We're going to actually define that here this time. So we're going to have this thing going back and forth and back and forth again, like it's supposed to. And let's take a look at this equation right here. So we're given that the displacement is x equals x0 sine omega t. And you have different versions with cos as well. It depends where you start your timer. Basically, if you start your timer at the end or in the middle, but it's actually not so important. The good news is I haven't seen questions where they literally had to use this exactly like this. They usually have you use things with velocities where the sines and the cosines sort of disappear. So I'll show you a little bit about that in a second. So let's look at this. So we have the actual displacement, which would be in meters. We have the maximum displacement. We call it the amplitude. It's also in meters. We have t, which is a time, which is in seconds. And we have the angular frequency, which is in, well, radians per second, technically, which is in, you know, one over second. So think about the units here. You have seconds times one over seconds. Those cancel out, which is good. So you take a sine of something with no units, you get an answer. And they have meters equals meters. Okay, good. The key thing, though, I think, is to know that um, velocity, how do we deal with that? We know that velocity is normally equal to the change in the position versus time, or change in displacement. So in this case right here, then, if we were to do this, if you remember any math, I mean, you don't have to do this derivation. I just think it's a good idea to show you where it came from. It didn't just come from outer space. It actually came from the definition of this. So watch very carefully. That means we're going to take the derivative of this, the first derivative. So to do that, let's see, this looks like a chain rule derivative. That means it's a function within a function. So that means to do this, I would take the derivative of the outside function, which would be x0 cos of omega t. I'd put the original inside, which I did. I'd multiply that by the derivative of the inside with respect to t, which in this case is omega. So that means I end up with, um, well, I can at least put it down. Now I have the final answer. So I have the velocity then is equal to um, how should we say it? Should we say x0 omega? I think that's how it looks, isn't it? Uh, no, they put the omega first. So omega x0 cos omega t. But you see, I didn't just make it up. It actually came from the definitions here. So that's actually, I think, pretty important here. So this, again, this tells you the uh, velocity of your particle, actually. It tells you how fast it's going at a given time. Um, there's another formulation of it as well that you can see. So they give you another one, which is this one. I think it's more useful because it doesn't have sines or coses in it. So again, this one, remember, it relates the uh, maximum displacement to the actual displacement. So this one here is maybe more useful. So let's talk about uh, how we deal with it here. The kinetic energy. Well, what's the equation for kinetic energy? Do you remember? Ek is equal to half mv squared. But remember what v is. Look, let's go back here. Let's take a V equation. V is uh, omega times square root of x0 squared minus x squared. Omega times x0. Oops. Omega times uh, square root of x0 squared. Let's put it right here. So that means then if I was to actually do this, I would have 1 half times m, and then I'll take this omega, uh, this v, which is this, I would square this whole thing. That means I'd end up with omega squared times, and then just I'd have x squared minus x squared here. x0 squared, sorry, minus x squared. This is it. And is this the equation we're given? Yeah. So this is the actual equation for the kinetic energy. So this tells you the kinetic energy at any given time. Well, not time, sorry. And uh, kinetic energy at any given position. So if we know the x value, remember, this will be locked. You'll be told like the maximum amplitude is whatever. Then that's this x0. x tells you the amplitude at any given point. So this kinetic energy then is the kinetic energy given a specific displacement value. Then you know your kinetic energy at any given time. Now to do the maximum kinetic energy in total, I think it helps to maybe try to draw these things here or to try to think about these here. Uh, so that's why I gave you this little drawing right here. Do you remember doing this before? This is in topic four, at least. Here we have x equals zero, and over here we have x equals max. If that's the case, then remember at x equals zero, we have EP equals zero, the potential energy is zero. Uh, but then if we have maximum displacement, then we have maximum dis, uh, potential energy. And in the same way, we can talk about Vs. V is zero at the end here, because it stops. 
And because of that, we have ek then equals zero because ek is half mv squared. And over here, v equals a maximum, therefore we have ek equals a max. And if we want to graph these, do you remember we also learned about this? This is um, displacement. Oh, actually, never mind, I have it right here. So we have this graph right here. So what ends up happening is this then. Depending on your different value of x here, let's see what the maximum kinetic energy is. Maximum kinetic energy in this case, do you notice it will be right here? See this little kinetic energy graph? By the way, that comes from all this, doesn't it? If you think about it, x equals zero, right? the potential is zero. See, that's why I put the little blue one as zero. But at x equals zero, v is maximum, so there it is. And that means ek is max, so in black, that's my ek graph. And this is what I want, I want maximum kinetic energy. So can you see that ek max? Do you see that? It's this value right here. That's my maximum kinetic energy. And when does it happen? Tell me uh, something about it. Um, do you know what value of x I put in here? Look at this, at maximum kinetic energy, does it make sense to you that x equals zero? Because that's where it's in the middle. Remember, the maximum kinetic energy happens when x is zero. We defined it here. Well, not even defined it, we found it here. So because of that, we know that x has to be zero. So you take your ek equation for anywhere, but for ek max, what do you do? You take the equation here along the top, but just set x equal to zero, it just disappears. Does that make sense? You just get one half m omega squared x zero squared, because we didn't have the minus x squared because the x squared was zero. So this is why we end up with this one, which I think again, pretty awesome. You can actually do this. So see, we're sort of, we're coming up with a lot of the equations, not all, but a lot of them. And now think about this, the total energy, I mean, at any given point, the total energy, et, so I like this because these are all kind of working out really nicely. If you understand energy, you're fine here. So the total energy, isn't it just a kinetic plus the potential at any given point? But remember, I could have done this anywhere. I could have done it, you know, in the middle right here, the total energy would be this because it would be zero plus this. Over in here, this other extreme, it would, the total energy would be this potential because potential plus kinetic, which is zero. Over here would be this. Basically, we get a straight line here for ET. This is important. Because then, can you notice, you can find the total energy at any given point. But what if we know a specific point where one of them is zero? Doesn't that make it easier? Let's look, for example, when is potential zero? Isn't the potential zero at x equals zero? If we set x equal to zero here, we have the potential is zero. Therefore, it's just ek max. So this is why the total energy is equal to ek max. Do you notice that then? See, that's why it's exactly the same equation. You end up with one half m omega squared x zero squared. So I'm just trying to show you where the equations came from. They didn't come from outer space here. They are right there. Whoops, what I'll do, what I'll say, undo that. I'm actually going to put it right here and attempt to do it nicer. I like this. Oh, what did I do? I was trying to draw a rectangle. It's always fun to watch someone fiddling with a computer, huh? Not at all. But there we go. So this is how we find the total energy. We can say it's equal to the kinetic maximum just because at that point potential is zero. So then it makes it real easy. So that's why that was a little bit convenient. We could have chosen it anywhere, of course, and it would have been ek max plus ep. The problem is then it gets really messy and there's a lot of other terms there. But we can actually just set it equal to ek max and away we go. So that's how we can find the total energy. So to see how these equations are related, they may look gross, but can you see how they don't just come from outer space, they come from somewhere. Now from simple harmonic motion, we also have uh, a couple of equations here. So we have the pendulum equation, which uh, equates the period which most people know that, but maybe I'll put it down anyway just to be safe. So T is the period of oscillation, which is measured in seconds. So is this one right here. So maybe we'll just put that down here. And if we have a pendulum that's oscillating back and forth, it has a length L. So that's this length of the pendulum, that's measured in meters. G is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, so that's in meters per second squared, and that would be 9.81. So this is basically your equation relating the period. Um, which is kind of interesting. So that means that if you had like a whole bunch of different pendulums of different lengths, and then you were to measure the period, turns out through that and a graph, uh, you could actually determine uh, g, for example, the acceleration due to gravity. Uh, in the same way, you have a spring equation. It looks very similar to it, doesn't it? Except the mass here is in kilograms. Spring constant uh, f equals kx, that would be in uh, newtons per meter because we have an equation f equals kx, and that's still the same case. So k is f over x, therefore has units of newtons 
per meter. That's how I knew that. And then we have the t is in the period. Uh, t is the period in seconds. You might be asked something here. I think it's a good idea just to know that those equations exist in case you need to use them. So if you have a spring, you use this uh, 2 pi m over k. And again, if you had a bunch of uh, data points of mass versus the period, then from there you could actually determine through a graph. Let's say here you graph t squared versus l. Turns out because you have t squared equals uh, 4 pi squared over g. Because I just squared both sides here. Um, so if I did a graph of t squared whoops, t squared versus l, I would end up with a straight line and the slope would be this. So you can see that, that right there would be the gradient of this graph. So if we did this graph over here, the gradient of it, that would be four pi squared over g. In this case here, if I graph t squared uh, versus m, let's see what I would get. Well, because I have t squared equals, let's see, I'm gonna square both sides. So that means I have four pi squared, um, over k, and I'm going to say that's times m. So in a similar way right here, from there I can determine then, oh, this right here is the gradient. All right, so I've had a graph of t squared versus m in kilograms, then I would expect to get a straight line through the origin, and the slope, or the gradient, would be equal to 4 pi squared over k. Therefore, I could solve for k. Do you see that? If I could get the graph, I could find the slope, or the gradient, sorry. And then from there, I could get k, because I would know that k equals uh, 4 pi squared over the slope. Because I've just rearranged this. So to see how these equations can actually come in and help you out. But um, I haven't seen them ask very much about them. I think it's a good idea just to know that they exist and how to use them in case you need them.